My name is Ben Frischberg. I'm a neurologist, and I specialize in neuro-ophthalmology. So needless to say, I've been involved with blepharospasm from my fellowship in 1984-1985 in Emory in Atlanta, where we used oculinum toxin to treat blepharospasm patients since the first few years when it first came out. So I can summarize my first talk in three words. Medicines don't work. And we can go over some of the historical features of medications and talk a little bit more about the disease and the medications that have been used. But at the end of the day, oral medicines really add very little except side effects. So thank you all for having me. Thank Peter for <laughs> bringing me. Thank the board. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the nine essential blepharospasm in a historical context. This was interesting for me to do a little research into, into um, nine essential blepharospasm. And I, I look back at <clears throat> some of the classic neuroophthalmic texts going back to the 20s and 30s and read about blepharospasm and what they thought about it. And, and you, as you well know, years ago, it was usually felt to be a psychologic or psychiatric disease because we didn't understand it. And we physicians are often guilty of making assumptions about causes when we don't understand, we think they're not real. But indeed it is. We'll talk about some of the historical aspects of blepharospasm therapy and I'll share with you some treatments in, in the 50s, what they used. Then we'll talk about the different medications that have been used, their side effect issues, how effective they are or are not. Then we'll move into some historical aspects, talk about botulism and botulinum toxin. And again, some of the history of how it was developed, not only medically, but for, uh, for uh, uh, warfare purposes. And then there'll be a break, we'll have questions and answers, we'll have lunch, and I'll finish up with talking more about the therapeutic use of the botulinum toxins. We'll talk about the four currently available toxins that, that are available on the market. So let me ask you a few things. How many people in this audience have been on Artane? Not many. How many have been on Clonopin? A few more. Let me, do either of those significantly help your blepharospasm? How many of you have been on a botulinum toxin? Anybody ever heard of Rabilon? So this is a coming, uh, one of the best reviews ever on, on, on benign essential blepharospasm was done in the 50s. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but it talked about all the drugs that are being used. And he reviewed all the literature for 20 years and all the treatments that were used at Mayo Clinic and over 100 patients they had with blepharospasm. And Rabilon was one of the medications that was a mixture of all of these uh, cholinergic agents, most of which are well-known poisons, as is botulinum toxin. So a little bit about the history of blepharospasm. So the artist Bruegel, and there's now Bruegel syndrome, is maybe one of the first people that ever depicted a patient with a facial dystonia. And Bruegel syndrome is now known as there may be blepharospasm, but there's, there is dystonia of the jaw. So people have this inability to close their mouth. And this is a picture he had from the 1500s. And subsequently, we now have Bruegel syndrome, Mage syndrome, and benign essential blepharospasm. And they're probably all part of the same continuum. Henry Mage in 1910 described patients with voluntar involuntary eye closure as well as other movements of the, low, of the face and the mouth. And that became known as Mage syndrome. And it actually was described before that, but he's the one that, that got, the, uh, got the name on the syndrome. In the 1950s, Dr. Henderson, who was an ophthalmologist, um, an orbital surgeon at, at Mayo Clinic, wrote a really like a 60-page review article on benign essential blepharospasm. It was the most comprehensive article that had ever been done. He reviewed all the literature and reviewed all of the patients they had at Mayo Clinic. And I'll 
again, share with you some of his, some of the things he did. The Banana Central uh, Blepharospasm Research Foundation was started, you know, by Matty Lou in 1981, and it was really at that point in time that this, this disease became better known among neurologists and ophthalmologists, and it was about that time that botulinum toxin was first getting started for use. So in Henderson's article in 1956, there were a series of 135 cases. 73 had been treated with various drugs, a little more than half. This is all at the Mayo Clinic. And over a 30-year period of the study, drugs that were used, Rabalon, which is, as I say, a, a mixture of atropine-like drugs. Um, one of them is hyacine. Stramonium is another. Um, it's Jimson weed. So Jimson weed is a common weed that has cholinergic properties, makes your eyes dilate, and affects the brain in certain ways. It can be a hallucinogenic, and that class of drugs was being used for what were called the hyperkinetic movement disorders. Artane was being used in the 50s. So it's been around for a long time. Benadryl, get that over the counter. And antihistamine that has some actually anticholinergic properties. Benzedrine, amphetamines were used, 10 cases. Regular ben benzedrine is a form of amphetamine as well as regular amphetamine. Phenobarbital, tincture of opium, quinine, tulsarol was this very strange drug that was taken off the market, used to treat movement disorders, and elixir of allurate, which is another barbiturate. So for the most part, none of these drugs even exist anymore. In 1973, in an article in the Southern Medical Association Journal, Henry Coles wrote, essential blepharospasm is a severe progressive bilateral facial spasm affecting older individuals. Its cause is unknown. As the disease becomes severely disabling a trial of medical therapy, back then it was L-DOPA, medication used for Parkinson's disease, which really didn't help, um, is justified. This often is not successful. If not, the preferred treatment is bilateral differential nerve resection with avulsion of the nerve branches. They essentially took all the nerves of the facial muscles and pulled them out. So you had complete paralysis. Again, don't really do that. Although the response to surgical therapy is variable, it's presently the best treatment for the incapacitated patient who fails to respond to medical treatment. So back in the 60s and 70s, you would have tried some medicines that would make you very sick, and then if you continued to want to be treated aggressively, they would have done surgery that would have permanently altered your face. So some other drugs, this is, this is from another study done looking at other drugs that were used. Trihexphenidyl, um, the second one is Artane. And tetrabenazine um, is a medicine that's been used by movement disorder specialists for years, but it was brought in from out of, out of the country. It was not approved in the U.S. It's now actually available in the U.S. as a drug called Xenazine. It's indicated for patients with Huntington's disease, for the Korea movements of Huntington's disease. Um, also wasn't very effective. And it shows here, of all the drugs, that was somewhat effective. Most were minimally effective or not effective. Other drugs used were Cinemet, which is, which is L-DOPA, um, lithium, and clonopin. So on the BEBRF website, if you look through it, there's actually a lot of good information. There is a section on medicines. So I've taken that section, I think it was probably written a while ago, and we can go over kind of the drugs that are kind of currently in use. One is the anticholinergics, which are Artane and Cogentin. They block the certain motor receptors, but they have side effects. They cause dry mouth, constipation, visual blurring, um, and memory impairment. Benzodiazepines, Valium, Clonopin, Ativan, they're all in the same class. They're, they were designed as anti-anxiety agents. They do help calm people. They're sedating. They're potentially um, um, either addicting or people develop, can develop tolerance to them and can't stop them suddenly if they do, anxiety levels go way up and there can be serious side effects. Um, baclofen or Leorosol is a medicine we use for 
treating certain kinds of stiffness in the legs in patients with multiple sclerosis. Um, that's also been used. It stimulates gamma aminobutyric acid receptors or GABA receptors. It's pretty sedating. Um, the reason I said this has to be a little old because it has dopamine receptor agonists and it has a medicine called bromocryptine or parladel. And we've had, we have multiple other dopamine receptor agonists, some of which have been out already to be generic. So ropinirol or Requip. Again, those drugs don't seem to be very helpful. There are medications that were used that were used as it we call neuroleptics, used to treat people with psychotic disorders. Haldol being one of them. Haldol often stops all sorts of movements, but when you stop the Haldol, the movements can get worse. And there's reports of people taking Haldol and Thorazine and those kinds of drugs, which has triggered their leptospasm as well. So monoamine uh, in, uh, depleters, uh, again, tetrabenazine or xenazine was one. Um, doesn't work. Any convulsants, a whole bunch. Neurologists always end up relying on, on medications uh, that reduce overall nerve irritability. So this is levetiracetam or Keppra. We've used a whole variety. I think Dilantin was used in the distant past. All these kinds of medicines that calm down irritable nerves. Kinds of drugs we use for epilepsy, but again, not very effective. Even Ambien has been tried. I think it puts you to sleep, so, it doesn't, so your, your blinking doesn't bother you. Um, it, and if you did blink, you forgot you did. That's what Ambien, you know, somebody told me that the way Ambien works is you still don't sleep, but you just don't remember you didn't sleep. <laughs> you hear the stories about Ambien. People get up in the middle of the night, they're, they're gaining weight, and they think somebody's breaking into the refrigerator, and they're putting on weight because they get up in the middle of the night, they eat, and they don't remember it in the morning. People will go out and drive and not remember they did it. Scary. Um, again, uh, um, Clozaril or Clozapine is another antipsychotic medication. Um, periactin is a strange drug. It's a, it's, it works against serotonin receptors. We, it's an also kind of an antihistamine. We use it in children with migraine. Um, and finally, some medications used to treat heart ailments that also kind of reduce irritability, mixilatine being one. So these are all the medications listed on the website. And I suspect that some of you have been on other medications that aren't listed here. But at the end of the day, oral medication just really doesn't work. Now, sometimes oral medication in addition to a botulinum toxin or the addition of an anti-anxiety agent in some patients may kind of calm them and possibly when you're calmed more, your spasms are less. But for the most part, these really don't work in, in any direct way. So I personally don't have anybody on medication. And when patients come to me and say, I, uh, botulinum toxin isn't working for me, what else can I do? Isn't there a medicine? Sometimes I'll try a few things, but I let them know up front it's not. Unlikely, Artane still is probably one of the mainstays, but it causes a lot of side effects, especially as you raise the dose enough to be effective. People have terrible dry mouth. Uh, older men can have prostate issues and urinary retention. So let's move from that. And during the Q&A, if you have any specific questions about medications, we can address those. So we'll talk a little bit about the botulinum toxins. This is a, a uh, picture of the protein. It's a very complex protein of botulinum toxin A. So do you know how many toxins there are? How many different classes? There's seven classes. There's, there's four toxins that are available medically, but there's seven classes of toxins. Three of the toxins we have available to us now are in the same class. That's botulinum toxin A. So let me ask you, what was the first FDA indication for botulinum toxin treatment, and this is Botox. Was it wrinkles, sweating, or axillary hyperhidrosis, as we call it, cervical dystonia or torticollis, or was it blepharospasm? 
Leprospasm and strabismus, they came out together. 1989, FDA approved these drugs. First approval of a botulinum toxin. And where, where does botulinum toxin come from? Is it from a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, dirty laundry, or doctor's ties? It's a bacteria. It's a, it's a very large bacteria. It was discovered actually quite early. So botulism as a disease was first described by Justinus Kerner, who was a German physician and a poet. Did a lot of poetry, yeah. I'm not sure I know many other neuropthalmic poets. One. And it was associated with spoiled sausage. And there was, sausage poisoning was not that rare, and people would have bad sausage and get poisoned, and they would get paralyzed, and they would stop breathing and die. So they named this, this illness botulism after the Latin word for sausage, which is botulus. Here's a nice picture of some nice hanging sausages. Um, more than 70 years later, Dr. Emile Pierre von Ermingen, <laughs> probably butchered that, of Belgium, um, was asked to investigate an outbreak of botulism following a funeral dinner. He was able to make a connection between botulism and a bacteria. At that point in time, the microscope had been invented, late 1700s, Leeuwenhoek. And they were able to find, and this is a big bacteria, um, and he was able to connect this to this bacteria. And he named it Bacillus botulinus, and we now call it Clostridium botulinum. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of things happened after that to identify the, the seven different classes of toxins that this, that this organism makes. It is an incredibly, it's a bad bacteria. You know, you can get botulism three ways. You can get it by ingesting it in spoiled foods. You can get it from a wound, so it can grow in a wound. And I've seen that a few times. People who skin pop Mexican heroin, black heroin, certain kind of heroin. They get, the wound grows botulism and it makes the toxin and they present with difficulty with weakness and then they proceed to go on to get completely paralyzed and then you have to put them on a ventilator and give them antitoxin and usually they get better but maybe months on the ventilator before they're better. And infant botulism. So usually from honey, there can be small amounts. Um, it gets into the gut. And the bacterial, the small amounts can grow in the gut and, and create a problem for infants. So in 1928, uh, Dr. Summer at the University of California isolated botulinum neurotoxin type A and purified it. In 1946, Dr. Edward Shands, who just died recently, and he actually wrote a, a whole um, nice historical article on botulism. He was a young U.S. Army officer stationed at Fort Diedrich. He was a Ph.D. in, in biochemistry who had an interest in, in, in food science. Um, and his, he and his colleagues purified botulinum toxin A in massive quantities for use for the government and educational institutions. The Office of Strategic Services, which is the precursor to the CIA, developed a plan for Chinese prostitutes to assassinate high-ranking Japanese officers using gelatin capsules filled with botulism, with botulinum toxin. Couldn't find any pictures. <laughs> so in the 1966s, I think it's supposed to be the 19, 1960s, Dr. Shands got together with Dr. Alan Scott. Dr. Scott is an ophthalmologist in San Francisco at the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute. And he thought, we can use this to treat children with strabismus, children with lazy eyes. If we could weaken the good muscle a little, that eye that's out will come in or the eye that's in will come out 
And especially when they're small, their eyes can work together so they don't develop a lazy eye, they don't develop amblyopia. And so he started looking at the using botulinum toxin A in, initially in monkeys to treat what we call strabismus or lazy eye. In the 70s, he form a, formed his own company, Oculinum Inc., to develop Botox as a therapeutic tool. In 1978, the FDA gave him approval to try it in humans. The original batch was 150 milligrams. Now, what you have to understand about botulinum toxin is incredibly powerful. 150 milligrams. That's probably as much as one nice piece of C's chocolate weighs. Not very much, maybe a few pieces. And it was enough to give 250,000 injections. When they make a, a batch of, of botulinum toxin, it lasts for years. But why is it so expensive? Um, and for many years, it was the only batch approved by the FDA because the FDA at that time had to approve it batch by batch. They couldn't just give you permission to make this, this drug. They had to, each time, they had to give you permission. So this is just a young, a young child with strabismus. You see the, the crossed eye. So in the early 1980s, uh, Dr. Scott began publishing studies um, looking at that of some, of the, some of the people he'd done. There was a large strabismus study done, and it looked to be safe. They kind of sorted out how much the toxin to use and the side effect issues. And other things started being considered. What else can this be used for? And I think it was probably about 1980 two or so that it was first used, 81, 82, when it was first used for blepharospasm. Um, in 1982, there was a large study looking at strabismus, and by 1984, reports were in the literature talking about the use of oculinum for treatment of benign essential blepharospasm. How many people here started getting treated in the 80s? I know there's somebody. <laughs> Yeah, so it's been there a, a long time. And it was 1987 was the first report by a, by a Canadian dermatologist um, who started using Botox for wrinkles. So somebody thought about that a long time ago. He did it on his receptionist. Um, in 1988, Allergan acquired the rights to use Botox um, and to market it, but they didn't own it and began to conduct clinical trials for other kinds of problems, and by that time, a blepharospasm study had been done. Um, so they acquired the rights to distribute Scott's batch of botulinum toxin. It was still called oculinum, and a year later, the FDA approved botulinum toxin for treatment of strabismus and blepharospasm. Shortly thereafter, Al again bought the company and changed the name to Botox. Um, I'm told that Dr. Scott shopped this botulinum toxin to major pharmaceutical companies. They all said, for this rare disease, essential blood pressure, it's too small. We're, we don't want to, we're not interested. This small company, Allergan, at the time, mostly made eye drops. They made drops for glaucoma, lubricating drops. Not a very big company. But yeah, we're interested. We all should have bought stock in Allergan then. <laughs> so in 1989, um, Botox was approved in the U.S. as an orphan drug to treat strabismus, blepharospasm, and facial nerve disorders, which includes hemifacial spasm, um, associated with dystonia in patients 12 years of age and older. <laughs>